let us move to the next chapter which is the introduction to the relational model. So, our goal in this chapter is to familiarize people with the concepts of the relational model and in particular to look at a number of operations which are called the relational operations which are used on relations. And these operations form the basis for the SQL language and if you want to understand how SQL is implemented internally, even if you want to understand how to write queries in SQL, you have to understand uh, the basic operations on the relational model. So, on this slide you see a, the same example of a relation which we saw before, but now you will notice a few things. Uh, first I mentioned that columns are called attributes, this is shown explicitly in this slide. So, the name attribute comes from the formal uh, modeling of things as relations that from the theoreticians, columns came from the practitioners. So, both are used interchangeably. Then you have a notion of rows or tuples, a tuple has a formal definition as a, a set of n values each from some domain. Again, there is a little more formalism on this in the book. But in the interest of time, we have cut it down here and we will call uh, rows as tuples or uh, rows interchangeably. Now, each attribute has a type which is called the, uh, the set of values which is defined by the type is called the domain of the attribute. Now, each attribute value is normally required to be atomic that is indivisible. What do we mean by this? Uh, is a name divisible? If you break a name into first name and last name, yes it is divisible. But if we treat a name as just the name with no further breakup, it is indivisible. Now, dividing name into first name and last name is not really a big deal, because instead of storing one attribute called name with two parts, we could store two attributes first name and last name. So, that is not really a big issue. The bigger issue is when you start interpreting the parts of an attribute in different ways and we will come back to this when we uh, look at normalization theories. Now, the special value null is part of every domain in any uh, database system. Now, what does null represent? It represents that either that particular tuple does not have a value associated with that attribute or maybe it has a value, but we do not know what that value is. So, value null represents both these possible situations. We do not know exactly which one of these situations a particular null represents, but it just means we do not know uh, values in there. So, coming back, the null value, which means unknown, actually complicates many operations, and we are going to look at its impact on each of uh, several operations coming up in. Now, the uh, columns or attributes we will usually refer to formally as a1 through an, and we will have a we will call R uh, with a capital letter uh, being a list of attribute names as a relational schema. Now, this is in some sense a proto schema because it does not include attribute types and so forth. We will give a list of attributes and call it the relational schema. And for the purpose of uh, design, we are not going to worry about the types initially and then add the types as a second part of the design. We will also uh, call a uh, relation or table, we will use these two words interchangeably. Again, the word relation comes from the formal people and the, uh, the theoreticians and the word table comes from practitioners, but they mean the same thing over here. And tuple as is to row is also something we already saw. Now, something which people should note is that relations are inherently unordered. Now, when you look at the contents of a relation, the system has to show you the rows in some particular order. But what I want to emphasize here is that the relational model does not assign any inherent order to the rows of a relation. So, earlier we showed the instructor relations ordered on ID. That was just a convenience for presentation. It might also be how it is stored, but at the uh, logical model level, the sorting, the sort order is irrelevant. That is a part of the physical model, which we do not worry about when we write queries. So, what does this mean? When you write a query, you say, uh, you know, show me all the tuple, instructor tuples. It might be that the tuples are shown in increasing order of ID, but there is no guarantee. 
if you do want it to be shown in increasing order, then in the query language you have to say, show me the contents of the instructor relation sorted on id in increasing order. So, all that is part of the query language. It is not a property of the logical uh, relational model. Sort order is not part of the logical model. It is a physical property. Now, what is a database? It is basically a collection of multiple relations. Now, in the university case, we are going to break it up into a number of relations. We have uh, instructor, we have student, we have course, uh, we have uh, which instructor teaches which course. Actually, it is a little more complicated. A course like CS 101 has an existence independent of a particular offering of the course. The same course is offered every year or maybe even twice a year. So, a particular instructor teaches a particular offering of the course in a particular year semester or maybe a particular section of that course. So, all these kinds of details we are going to look at coming up. But before we get into specifics, um, I want to show another example of bad design where we combine instructor ID name, department name, salary, student ID and a whole bunch of other stuff from three different relations, instructor, student and advisor. Now, why on earth would we combine information like this? It seems idiotic, you know. So, in all our examples, we are saying first here are the relations and by the way, if you combine it, it is a bad idea. But you might say, why would you combine it? What is the point of normalization? And the point here is, how do we get at this collection of relations in the first place? And there is a history to this. If you look at the formal work on normalization theory, which we will again see later on, it was based on the notion that we put all the information about a particular enterprise into one single relation called the universal relation, put it all together and then break it up into smaller pieces based on certain properties such as functional and multivalued and other dependencies, which we will see later on. However, in practice, uh, that approach did not take off. What took off was the entity relationship modeling approach, which does things differently and starts off by breaking things up and then comes up with a set of relations. And the point here is that if somehow you came up with a relation which combined irrelevant information, you might land up with some problems. In fact, uh, the one of the problems which is repetition of information we saw earlier. We saw that earlier that if the same department name appears twice, it should have the same building and salary. Here, um, if you have uh, instructor, uh, department name, salary, student ID and so on. Supposing, uh, so th this was combining students with instructor through an advisor relation. So, this instructor is an advisor to this student. So, if there are two students with the same advisor, all the fields of that instructor, name, department name and so on would get repeated. But there is another problem. Supposing I am storing here student ID, name of the student and other information, but a particular student does not have any advisor. How do I store information about that student in this particular relation? The only way I can do it is by uh, having null values for instructor ID, name, department name and salary, because there is no associated advisor. So, all of these cause problems. So, we want to break it up into several parts. Now, again some notation. Uh, this is about keys. Again, many of you may be familiar with this. So, first of all, there is a notion of what is a super key. What is a super key? It is a subset of attributes which of the original schema are. Note here that we are saying let k subset of or equal to r. What do we mean by that? R is a set of attributes, K is any subset of those attributes. We say that K is the super key of R if the values for K are sufficient to identify a unique tuple for each possible relation small r of R. Now, there are several notations which are combined in this one line. First of all, small r open parenthesis capital R close parenthesis. What does that mean? First, capital R is a set or a list of attribute names that is a schema small r in parenthesis like this says that small r is a actual relation with that schema. And what do we mean by each possible relation? 
Well, let us suppose that uh, the relation in this case is instructor. Today, there is a set of instructors in IIT. Tomorrow, somebody retires, somebody joins the set of instructors changes. So, the relation instructor remains, but the contents of that relation keep changing. So, by uh, a relation instance, we mean the current contents of a particular relation. In say the instructor relations instance is maybe the current contents of uh, the current set of instructors. Now, a set of attributes is a super key if the values in there are sufficiently sufficient to uniquely identify a tuple in every possible instance of that relation. Now, what do we mean by every possible instance? Now, there are some real world constraints. In this case, if it were the instructor relation, we might say that id is a super key because it uniquely identifies instructor. Now, if somebody goofs up and gives the same id to two different instructors, id is not a super key. That is a mistake. This is an illegal state of the world. In fact, I have a colleague here who was issued a PAN number, which is identical to the PAN number issued to somebody else with the same name uh, in Chennai. And he has this big problem every year when he files his returns, there are two sets of returns filed with the same PAN number. And that has been causing endless trouble for him. And he uh, luckily being in the computer science department here uh, had um, colleagues and others who were, or he had consulted for people who knew people in the uh, income tax department and they were trying to figure out how to fix it. It is a big problem if you have a goof up like this. So, anyway, this brings up the issue of a legal state of, in any legal state of the world, no two people should have the same PAN number and that is what we are talking about. So, here ID is a super key, assuming no two instructors are given the same ID, but also ID comma name is a super key. What do we mean by this? Well, if you have a, a given value for ID name, it is impossible for two people to have the same value of ID name. In this case, because ID by itself is already enough. But there are other cases where ID by itself is not enough. You need to add something more. For example, how do we identify a particular course offering? There is a course, CS 101. It is offered maybe in summer 2013, and that is a particular offering. And there may be two sections of that course in maybe not in summer, maybe in autumn, there may be two sections of CS 101. So, we are going to identify an offering of CS 101 by the course ID that is CS 101, the year 2013, the semester autumn or summer or whatever and a section ID in case there are two offerings of the same section in the same semester or the same course in the same semester. Together, these four attributes will uniquely identify a particular offering of the course. So, it is a super key. Now, a super key is said to be a candidate key if it is minimal. So, for example, id comma name, is it a super key? Yes, it is. Is it minimal? No, because even if you drop name, id by itself is still a super key. Therefore, id comma name is not minimal, therefore, it cannot be a candidate key. On the other hand, id by itself is a candidate key because it is a super key and it is minimal. Now, a relation may potentially have multiple candidate keys. For example, we may give ids to students, but they may also have other ids. Right now, many or most have, but maybe not all. Uh, you know, next year, maybe all will have, well, barring foreign students. So, maybe we can use uh, Aadhaar as a candidate key also, but we have to choose one. So, let us say we choose id not Aadhaar. And the next concept is of a foreign key. It, this is actually a constraint which says values in one relation must appear in another relation. So, we saw this already. We saw that a department name in instructor must appear in the department relation. Some terminology here, we have a notion of a referencing relation. So, instructor would be the referencing relation for department name and department would be the referenced relation for this particular foreign key. So, the foreign key constraint is on a table which says the value here must appear in another table. Now, here is a schema diagram which shows the relations in our university database 
I want to spend a few minutes on this because all our queries, everything which we do in the first few days is based on this particular schema diagram. This represents part of the information of a university. Again, it's abstracted, simplified, but it's still complex enough to show many issues. So let's start off with this part of the diagram, which shows a student. The student has an ID, name, department name, and total credits. What do we mean by tot credit, total credits? So total number of credits which the student has completed and passed, let's say. Now, moving down here, we have department, which is uh, department name, building, and budget. Now, if you note in both these tables, the first attribute is underline. The underline of an attribute indicates that it is a pr primary key. Now, in some cases here, you will find there are, uh, in section relation, there are four attributes which are underlined. So, section has course ID, section ID, semester year. All of them are underlined. What that means is all of them together have been chosen as a primary key. Of course, that means that they uniquely identify the uh, a particular tuple in the section relation. Now, coming down here, we have instructor with ID, name, department name, and salary. And moving here, we have a course relation, which has course ID, a title, which is the name of the course, a department name. Every course, we insist, has to be associated with one department. And then we have credits, the number of credits for that course. So we have courses which have six credits, eight credits, three credits, which reflect how much effort it takes to uh, participate in that course as a student. Now you will notice arrows between all these tables. So these represent foreign keys. So take this arrow here from student department name arrow to department indicates that department name is a foreign key from student to department. Similarly, course has a foreign key from department name to department. Instructor similarly has a foreign key from department name to department. Now, let's look at this thing, section. As I said, a course can be offered many times. The section is a particular offering. We'll use the name section to refer to a particular offering of the course. Now, uh, as I said, this has four attributes which together uniquely identify it, but it has some extra attributes. It has a building and room number, which indicates in which room that section meets. So we are assuming that every time this section meets, this course meets, it's going to be in exactly the same room and building in this particular semester. There may be another offering of this course, that is another section, which may meet somewhere else. So that's, those are two extra attributes. And note that these two are foreign keys into a classroom relation which, where a classroom is uniquely identified by a building and a room number. And it has one extra attribute, capacity. So we do want to make sure that the enrollment of a course is less than or equal to the capacity of a classroom. Now, this is not a constraint which we can specify in SQL. It would be nice if you could, but it makes it too complex and makes it inefficient. So that is usually left to the application programmer to enforce when students are added to a course, maybe you enforce that uh, it doesn't exceed the strength. In fact, the enforcement here may be soft in the sense that you may allow it to exceed, but then you flag it so that the course is reassigned to a different room. So now, uh, coming back to course, the course ID forms a foreign key to the course relation. So section has course ID, which is a foreign key to course. And section also has uh, attribute time slot ID, which indicates at what time that section meets. Now, there are universities where uh, the course may meet at exactly the same time every day, so they may, uh, or on a particular set of days, so they may say that the time slot is Monday, uh, Wednesday, 11.30 to 12.30 uh, or something. In other places, it may be more complex. So we are going to have a time slot ID, which indicates at what times during a week a particular section meets. So all of these are based on a weekly schedule. So we have a time slot, which has an ID, a day, a start time, and an end time. Now, 
the same time slot id may meet say three times in a week. So, it will appear thrice when maybe different days with different start times. Note that time slot id day and start time are all underlined, end time is not. Why is that? These three are unique uh, enough to uniquely identify a particular time when the course meets. It is not possible for a section to start at the same time, but end at two different times that is impossible. But on a particular day, the section may meet once in the morning and once in the afternoon that is legal. So, we want the day and the start time as part of the primary key, but end time should not be. It would not even be a candidate key if you included it. It would be a super key, but not a candidate key. And finally, uh, these last two relations, we have a prerequisite relation, which indicates that some course is required before you take some other course. For example, in our department here in IIT Bombay, we have a data structures and algorithms course and most of our other courses require that a student have taken this first. Now, in the old ways of doing things, these prerequisites were implicit. It was assumed that a course in semester 3 should be taken before a course in semester 4. But these days, like many other universities, we give a lot of flexibility. Students can take courses out of order and so forth. However, the course depends on the student having understood the material of a preceding course. So, that is recorded in the prerequisite relation, which has two attributes course ID and prereq ID. If you see both are foreign keys back to course ID of the course table, but they serve different roles. The course ID is which course and prereq is which is the course which is a prereq for this one. So, uh, CS317 may have CS101 as a prereq, it may also have CS something else say 313 as a prereq. And finally, uh, we have the advisor relation, which indicates which student is advised by which instructor. And in this case, I think we have underlined SID, which is the student ID, which indicates that a student can have at most one advisor, they cannot have multiple advisors. So, this is the schema diagram, we will keep coming back to it. So, I already told you about uh, this issue of non procedural versus procedural and within the we, we are going to focus on the declarative or non procedural languages. Within this there are several pure languages which means they are formal without too much syntactic sugar and then there are real world query languages which people use to build real things. So, the pure languages there is a relational algebra and then there are the two forms of relational calculus. We are not going to cover it in this, the, we are not going to cover the two calculi in this course. We are going to focus on relational algebra and we are going to look at the number of relational operators because that is important to understand what goes on in a database. But after wrapping up quickly with relational algebra, we are going to spend more time on the SQL query language because that is what you need in the practical in the real world. But the relation algebra is very important to understand how an SQL query is executed. So, when we do internals, we are actually going to use the relation algebra operations. Now, I had a few instructors ask me what is the point of relation algebra? Nobody is going to write queries in relation algebra. Why should our students learn all this? It is just one more painful thing for them to learn. And the answer is it is very important to understand internals. So, uh, by all means do cover it. The relational calculi on the other hand are not that important, which is why we are skipping those. They are useful, there are query languages based on those, but in the interest of time we are not going to cover it. So, now we are going to have a quick tour of relational algebra by looking at the uh, several operations which together form the relational algebra. Now, all of you are familiar with algebra from school. So, what is algebra in mathematics? Well, you deal with plus, minus, times, division and so forth. What do they operate on? They operate on numbers. What kind of numbers? Integers, real numbers, maybe even complex numbers and so forth. In the context of the relational model, each of these operators which we are going to look at operates on relations. So, an operator takes 
one or more relations as input, generally one or two, and it outputs also a relation, just like plus, 5 plus 5 is 10, what are the types? Integer plus integer gives back an integer, real plus real gives an integer, real plus integer may give integer, let us not worry about those details. In the relational world, you take in relations and output relations. So, here is an example of the select operator, which selects tuples. Now, those of you who know SQL uh, know that SQL has a select clause, which is actually completely different from this. It corresponds to different relation algebra operation called project. This select relation algebra operator takes a table like this and outputs some subset of rows from this table. Now, in this case, let us say we want to select tuples where a equal to b and, and d greater than 5. So, let us look at the first table is a equal to b, both are alpha, yes, d greater than 5, yes, it is in the output. Next one a equal to b, no, that fails it, therefore, that particular tuple is not in the output. The third one, it does satisfy a equal to b, but it fails d greater than 5, so notice that it is not in the output. And the last one satisfies a equal to b, because both have the same value beta and d is 10, which is greater than 5. So, that is also in the output. So, this is the output of the select operator. We write it formally like this. Sigma is the Greek letter corresponding to s. So, select is s, so Greek sigma. Sigma a equal to b and d greater than 5 on r. Okay, so, that is uh, the uh, output there of this particular operation. Now, there is a quiz question here and fortunately, I do not think we can run the quiz on the clicker right now, unless our network is back. But here is something that you can uh, check out. I will just give you a couple of minutes and let you answer this question for yourself. So, so read the question and the choices and I will give you a minute. The question was the select a not equal to b or d less than 7. Again, we will go over each of these tuples. Does the first tuple satisfy a not equal to b? No, it fails. d less than 7, that also fails, that is out. The next tuple satisfies a not equal to b, it is in. The third one satisfies d less than 7, although it does not satisfy a not equal to b. So, that is also in. And the last one fails a not equal to b and it also fails d less than 7. So, the output is the middle two tuples and the answer is number 2, 2 tuples. Okay. So, that was a small exercise. The next one is uh, selection of columns, which is the project operator in relation algebra and the slide is titled selection of columns, because this is what uh, SQL means by select. I mean, we will come to SQL later, but there is a clause called select there and that is used to select columns or attributes. So, here is a relation with three attributes and different tuples. You will note that uh, each of the tuples is different, there is no repetition of tuples in this relation. And if you select only columns A and B, which is uh, in future we are going to call this projection to avoid confusion with the selection operation. So, if you project columns a and b, which is denoted here by pi, because pi is the Greek letter corresponding to p for project, pi a c r. So, project only columns a and c of r. So, what do we get here? We have alpha 1, another copy of alpha 1 from the second tuple. The b value is different, but a and c are the same. Then beta 1 and beta 2. Now, if you will notice that the first two tuples are the same after projection. This can happen after projection. And in the pure relation algebra, duplicates are removed. So, the net result is this relation here without duplicates. So, again there is a quiz question here, the projection operation, does it remove duplicates or does it not? As this thing here shows, it does remove duplicates. Now, I should also mention that there is a variant of the relation algebra, which does not remove duplicates and I will come to that later. And it turns out that this is the variant that SQL uses for various reasons, which we will come to later. 
Now, let us stick to the basic relation algebra. Here is an example which joins two relations through a Cartesian product. What is a Cartesian product? It outputs every pair of tuples. Now, this is a, by itself it is a pretty useless operation in most cases. There are only some rare instances where an actual Cartesian product is useful, but it forms the basis for the next operation which we will see coming up. But first, let us understand Cartesian product. So, here is in relation R, here is a relation S. Every tuple in R is paired with every tuple in S. So, if you see here, alpha 1 is paired with these four tuples. So, here are the four results uh, with alpha 1 and each of these tuples for C D E, if you look down here. Similarly, beta 2 appears here four times, once with alpha 10 A, next with beta 10 A and so forth. So, that is a Cartesian product shown by a x over here. And the typical use of a Cartesian product is to uh, use it as the first step and then follow it up with a selection. So, in this case, what we have done is we first did r cross s as in the previous slide, but we have added a select on top of that which is sigma a equal to c on r cross s. So, what is this doing? it is going to remove all pairs where a is not equal to c and retain only those where a equal to c. Now, we have something more useful. We are pairing up tuples which match on something and here what happened? Which are the ones which did match? The first one a and c are both alpha, it is retained. The next three tuples a and c do not match, they are all thrown out. The fourth tuple again a is beta, c is alpha, it is out. The next two a and C are both beta. So, those two tuples are in in the result and the last one again do not does not match. So, this is what we have. Now, if you go back to foreign keys, the most common use of uh, this particular operation, it is called the join which uh, first Cartesian product followed by an equality selection like this is to match up tuples from two tables which are linked by foreign key. It is not a requirement. There is absolutely no need that there be a foreign key relationship between it and there are many queries where such a relationship is not there, but a lot of queries do in fact uh, use join conditions on such foreign keys. And then there are a number of other operations. Now, the next three are all standard set operations, union, intersection and set difference. So, given these two tables R and S, the union puts together all the tuples that appear in both the tables. If you notice here, alpha 2 appears in R and in S and in the result of the union, it appears only once, not twice. Again, duplicates have been eliminated in this version of relation algebra. There is another version of relation algebra where the union would have two tuples, that is called the multi-set relation algebra. There would be two copies of alpha 2 in that case. Intersection here, the only common tuple is alpha 2, so that is the only thing present here. And finally, set difference is all tuples in this case R minus S is all tuples in R which do not appear in S. So, the first tuple is not there in S, it is there. Second tuple is in S, it is out. The third tuple is not in S. So, we have this as the result. Um, I think this would be a good point to see what questions are out there. So, a couple of questions. The first one was discuss schema and instance in detail. So, as I said, a schema is like the type. What are the attributes? What are the types and so forth? So, if you were writing a program in a language like Java or C, the schema would correspond to the actual variables which you have in the program. Now, an instance is the contents of those variables. So, if I have a variable x in a Java program, at a particular point in time, x may have the value 5. At some other point in time, as the program continues, x may get the value 10. So, the instance is the contents of the variable at a point in time. In the relational world, a relation R is has a schema that, uh, so the schema may refer to the set of attributes, um, but it is the, it is the type of the relation without worrying about its contents. The instance is the the contents of the relation at a point in time. The next few questions, 
uh, talking about care and wear care and so forth, people are jumping ahead. Uh, we'll uh, do that when we come to SQL. And the last question which I'm seeing here is, what is the exact meaning of minimal regarding candidate key? So what is minimal? This is a good question. All of us know what is minimum, right? Minimum means the smallest value. What is minimal? Minimal is meaningful in the context of a set. A set is minimal if with respect to some property, in this case being a super key, A, if it satisfies the super key, and B, no subset of that set is also a super key. Okay, so how do we check if a set is minimal? Well, we first drop one attribute, check if it is still a super key, then we drop the next attribute. We try it for every way to drop one attribute. If all of these fail in being a super key, we know that no subset of that set can be a super key. Therefore, that set is a minimal super key and therefore it is a candidate key. So in our context, we had ID and name as a super key. Now if we dropped name, what is left? We have ID. Is ID a super key? Yes, it is. Therefore, ID comma name is not minimal. But if we have uh, just ID, I mean anything with just one attribute is trivially minimal uh, unless the relation has only one possible tuple, which is silly. So in this case, um, we can't drop ID and still expect to have a super key. Therefore, ID is minimal and it would be a candidate key. Okay, I hope that answered the question. If you have questions on the relation algebra, uh, please pass it on to your uh, coordinators to type in now. Let me move ahead the next few things on relation algebra. But do pass on your basic questions now. So the end of this, I will take the questions on basic relation algebra. So here is an example of the natural join operation, which basically does the following. It's shown symbolically here with this bow tie symbol. And what it does is it takes two relations. First of all, it checks which attributes are common between these two relations. So here, what are the common attributes? A is not common, B is common, C is not common, D is common, and that's it. So B, D are the common attributes. Now it's going to take every tuple here and match it to every tuple here which have the same values for B and D. So take the first tuple. B is 1, D is A. Now look at the first tuple here. B is 1, D is A. Yes, it matches. So we have an output alpha 1, alpha A, alpha 1, alpha A. And the E attribute comes from here which is alpha. So that is one of the tuples in the natural join. Excuse me. The next uh, thing here. Is there any other match for this tuple? Is there any other 1a? Yes, there is. So the third tuple here is also 1a, but e is gamma. So we have the same first tuple output with gamma as the value for e. So that's also part of the natural join. Now moving uh, on similarly for the next tuple, uh, bd is 2a, which does not exist here. So this second tuple is lost in the natural join. It's not in the output. The third tuple has BD being 4B, that is also not present, it is lost. The fourth one is 1A again, and that appears once with alpha and once with gamma. So here, alpha 1 gamma, alpha 1 gamma A with alpha, and then match with this one here is there with gamma. And finally, delta 2 beta B, here 2 and B matches, this one tuple here 2B. So we have that one with delta. Okay, so that is the natural join example. There is again a quiz question. So coming back to this quiz question, the natural join operation as we just saw, um, so batches rows whose values for common attributes are equal. That is it. It is a very simple question. My goal here was to ask this quiz question based on the uh, output here and then explain natural join. So now this slide formally defines natural join of two relations. I'm going to skip the uh, details, um, but what this says is, it says, uh, it sh shows how to obtain the natural join. It says consider each pair of tuples, if they have the same value on each of the attributes in R intersection S. So what is R intersection S? 
again the remember the notation capital R capital S are the attributes of the relations, the relations are called small r and small s. R intersection s is the common attributes. So, if each at common attribute uh, has this uh, both the tuples have the same value for each common attribute, you add a tuple to the result, which has the same value as T r the tuple from R on attributes in R, this should have been capital R and capital S, pardon the error. So, for all attributes from this it has the value from here and for all attributes from the second relation it has the value uh, from the relation S. So, we have already seen this. So, what we have seen so far were what were called the basic relation algebra operations. Later uh, people realize that there is a very important class of operations which people need to do with relations which cannot be expressed using the basic operations which we had seen so far and these are what are called aggregate operations. It turns out some aggregate operations can in fact be expressed using the basic relation algebra, but not all. So, what is an aggregate? This was well, a function that takes a collection of values and returns a single value. So, average, min, max, sum, count and so on are all aggregate functions. These are the five basic aggregate functions in SQL. However, SQL allows many more aggregates and most databases have many more aggregates. For example, uh, standard deviation, variance, median and so on. These are all things which most databases support. Now, we will be seeing SQL syntax later on for aggregation, but at the relational algebra level, we are going to use the following syntax. We will use this funny letter here, which is the calligraphic capital G, okay, the calligraphic font. G stands for group by, but we are actually migrating towards gamma, because initially this is what several people used, but later for consistency with uh, you know the other relational algebra operations such as sigma for select, pi for project and so on. The Greek letter gamma is used these days by many people. So, instead of this we could use gamma, it means the same thing and there are two sets of things uh, arguments to this group by operator. We are showing one set on the left and one on the right. So, on the left are the group by columns and I will explain what this means coming up. On the right are the aggregate functions on specific attributes. Now, again notation wise some books will put these also on the right hand side, they are all on one side uh, and we know which is a group by attribute, uh, because these guys here will have an aggregate function, anything without an aggregate function is a group by attribute. So, again these notations are equivalent does not matter which you use. And this is an operator which operates on a relation, like all other op relation algebra operators, they operate on relations and give a relation. This one takes a relation, I am calling that E. So, here is a simple operation, where the group by attributes on the left hand side of this is empty. So, here is a relation and this is group by sum of C R. So, C is this one, sum of C on R adds up all the C values, in this case we get 27 and that is the output. Note the uh, result has an attribute name which we have labeled as sum C, uh, that is kind of system dependent uh, in actual implementation. So, you can use segregation by to uh, aggregate all the values in a relation into one value. But aggregation can also be used with grouping. So, take this particular query, find the average salary in each department. Now, we have an instructor relation which is shown below, where each instructor has a department name and a salary. To find the average salary in each department, we are going to group the tuples by department. So, if you notice here, biology there is just one instructor that is there. CompSci has three instructors, they have been brought together. Again finance has two, they are brought together and you will also notice here that it is sorted. Sorting it turns out is a very easy way to bring 
things which are have the same group by attribute together. So, we have sorted by department name. It is not essential, but it is one of the ways of doing that. Now, once we have brought it together, we can find all the corresponding tuples and find the average. So, for biology there is just one tuple, the average is equal to 72,000. For comp sci, there are three different values and the average is in this case 73,333.33, we'll ignore that and so forth. So, for finance there are two tuples and the average of is 85,000 which is shown here. So, that is the uh, complete uh, group by uh, aggregate operator. Now, you can put any aggregate operation you want here. We could have said sum, which would have added up these instead of finding the average. We could have said min, which would find the min salary. For comp sci, the minimum salary would be 65,000, max salary would be 92,000. We could have a count, which is how many people there are in effect here. So, for department computer science, you would have 3, biology would be 1 and so forth. So, you can use any, you can use have actually multiple things here. I can say average salary, comma, some salary to get multiple pieces of information using one operator. And if you want a name for it to be used later, as I said, uh, the name may be uh, unclear. So, what we are saying is AVG of salary as and give it a name. So, this is just a syntactic thing which gives a name to this attribute. All the other attributes have names because they came from uh, the name in the input table. There is also a rename operation in the relation algebra. I am going to skip it for simplicity. So, with that we are done with uh, this particular chapter. Uh, it is a good time to take some questions. So, so the first question which I am seeing here is why relation algebra, I mean all these operations are in SQL as well. So, what I want to say here is SQL is a complex language. The SQL standard um, back in 1992 covered a few thousand pages, around a thousand pages. By 99, I think it was some 7000 pages. Now, we have lost count of the number of pages. On the other hand, relation algebra has a handful of operators. We have already seen the major set of operators. There are more, uh, there is division and other things, but you do not really need any. So, uh, the other operators can actually be expressed in terms of these. Uh, so, at the formal level, you do not need any more operators unless you want more complex things. Where there are some cases where it is convenient to have other operators, um, but it is a very, very simple language. And if you are implementing a database system, it actually makes sense to take a complex language like SQL and translate it down into a simpler language, which is actually implemented underneath. So, in fact, the relational algebra forms the basis for database system implementations. They take SQL queries and turn them into some form of relational algebra, and then that is what is executed. It is actually a little more complex, because in addition to saying what are the operations, they are usually tagged with how the operation is to be executed. So, people sometimes call this the logical algebra versus the physical algebra. And so, these, this is what is used inside to uh, actually execute queries. So, if you want to understand the internals, you should understand relation algebra. Now, of course, you, anything which you can do in relation algebra, you can do in SQL. But the point is that we want a simple thing which covers all the functionality which we need and then build a language on top. Okay, the next uh, question is um, scroll up here. What is the need to cover SQL relation algebra and tuple relational calculus if you use SQL in application development? So, I think I just answered this question. If you want to understand internals, you must understand relation algebra. The calculi are less important, so it is exactly why I am not even covering it in this course. Um, in the question which says, is there any aggregate function to calculate the second maximum value? That is a good question. So, many times you want not only the maximum, but the next one and sometimes the third and the fourth and so on. Sometimes you want to rank 
I want the uh, rank of people in class. The maximum will be people with the first rank, the maximum marks. People will be the first rank. The next mark will be the second, and then the third, and so forth. So is there an operator for this? And the answer is, in the basic relation algebra, no. There is no operator to do this. The second maximum you can actually compute by a thing which first takes, finds a maximum, then does a set difference to remove it from that set, and then does a maximum again. So you can express second maximum in relation algebra by a cascading set of operations. Is this an efficient way of doing it? No, it is not. Now what if you want all the ranks of students in a class, can you do it using relation algebra? Turns out yes, you can, but it is very inefficient. In fact, uh, it becomes a quadratic operation, whereas you know very well that to find the ranks, you just have to sort by marks and then assign the ranks 1, 2, 3, so forth. That is how we do it. So it turns out that from the viewpoint of efficiency, even though the rank operator can be implemented using other relation algebra operators, uh, I leave it as an exercise how to do this using aggregations uh, and uh, cross product and select and so on. It is possible. I won't give you the solution now. It turns out it's a good idea to implement it as a basic operator. In fact, today uh, ranking is a basic uh, construct in SQL. Most uh, databases now support a ranking construct, which is defined as part of the SQL standard. And correspondingly, their implementation will have a ranking operator, which gives ranks to tuples, first, second, third rank, and so on, based on some attribute and some ordering of that attribute. The next question says, um, DBMS book by uh, Raghu Ramakrishnan does not uh, include aggregates as part of relational algebra. That is another good question. Uh, incidentally, uh, Raghu was my PhD advisor. So, uh, you know, we, we, he and I can have a little fight about this, maybe. <laughs> but seriously, um, the basic relational algebra did not include the aggregate operator. And when it was first defined, uh, Cord and others showed that it is equivalent in expressive power to what is called first order logic. So that is a branch of mathematics with a long history. And basically, the point they wanted to make is that relational algebra is as expressive as first order logic. What they did not say is that first order logic is all that one requires in the real world, but they defined relational algebra with a particular set of operations. Soon enough, practitioners started using it and they realized in the real world, people often need aggregates and you cannot express aggregates in either basic relational algebra or first order logic. So then people defined what is called extended relational algebra, which includes aggregates. So even in our book, we differentiate between the basic relational algebra and extended relational algebra. For the purpose of this course, I uh, papered over the differences. Um, in the end, uh, the equivalence to first order logic is a theoretical concept which most of us do not need to worry about in real life. But what we do need to know is that these relational algebra operators exist and are important in SQL implementations. The last question in this set is how to apply aggregate function on another aggregate function, for example, maximum of count. So this is one of the basic things in any algebra, whether it is your algebra which you learnt in school or the relational algebra. The output of one operator is of a type which can be fed into another operator. So for example, we can uh, group by uh, department count instructor to find the number of instructors in each department. This is a relation. On this, you can apply a, another operation. So let me use the um, drawing board here and see this group by, uh, we wanted the uh, number of instructors in each department. Uh, so, the input to that, what is the input? Not department, because department does not keep track of how many instructors there are. But the input to it is the instructor relation, where the instructor has a department name attribute. Department name, so that is the group by. And then we have count, 
we can just say count star which says how many instructors there are in each department. So, the output of this thing might say C S 3, physics 2, history 1, economics 2 and so forth. Now, on this we can apply the max. So, we can say group by max. Uh, now, this has to have a name. So, let us say count star s let us call it c. So, we go in an attribute name c. Now, we can say max of c on this. So, this is an operator whose input is this whole thing here from here to here. Okay. So, now we found the count using this part of the query and then we got the max from that. So, that is how you can cascade these to get aggregates and on that another aggregate and so forth. Now, you can write these in SQL as well. I am not going to emphasize too much writing these complex queries in relational algebra. Like I said, our goal is to use it for internals, uh, but it is eminently possible to write queries directly in relational algebra. And it is also important uh, from the viewpoint of understanding the internals, when you see a query plan, it is going to be in some form of relational algebra. You need to understand what it does. You may not need to write it yourself, but you should be able to understand what it means. So, the next question is what is null in a relation? Is it true or false? I am going to cover nulls in a lot more detail. Uh, so, I will answer these questions coming up. I am going to answer it in the context of SQL. You could define all of these in the context of relational algebra also, uh, just like multi sets, nulls, and so forth, aggregates with nulls. There are many issues with nulls. So, I am going to answer all of these in the context of SQL rather than relational algebra. Uh, there are a few other questions which I will. Um, okay, there's one more question. Where can we write relational algebra queries to extract results? So there is no implementation of relational algebra out there, which you can use. But one of the assignments which I have given as uh, to my students, I think it's also there in this course as an optional assignment uh, for JDBC, is to build a simple relational algebra interpreter on your own. So, you can actually take input and execute relational algebra queries, but you have to build it yourself. But practically, it is not relevant because nobody wants to write relational algebra queries. SQL is a lot easier to write queries in. Okay, I am going to uh, stop there on the questions.